Hello, welcome to the Metapod, the Pokemon TCG podcast that revolves around the evolving meta. My name's Jake. I got Sean over here. Sean. What up? It was really interesting to uh, to get ready for the podcast because we were like 2 p.m. recording time. And then all of a sudden <laughs> I was like, yeah, wait, 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 can we do it at three? Can we please do it at three? Sean was like, sure. Then Sean was like, wait, 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 what about four? And I was like, all right, okay. Then he's like, 4.30. And then he's like, five. And then he's like, four. Wait, we can do it right now. And yeah, I was like, no, what's I was, happening? Uh, I, I was, lots of things being taken on and off of my calendar all of a sudden. And I was just like, what is happening? What, what's going on? Yeah. I also just want to toot my own horn over here. Okay. That I said that there was going to be a Champions Path premium collection box. The whole bunch of thousand cards. And look at that. The same day, a couple hours after the podcast, they announced it. Yeah. Let's go. So I'm not dumb. Now, I will say we don't know technically what's in it, but we're still holding on to that original prediction that the Zard VMAX Hyper Rare is going to be the promo in that that uh, premium collection box. Hell yeah. So uh, that the timing on that was just perfect. Pod goes out, Quite, news drops an hour later, and you're just like, yo! I got, I got a couple of messages and a couple of like Twitter. I was psyched. <laughs> I was like, dude, let's go. I felt so intelligent. Um, but anyways, um, something that we can open though, a product that we do know about that just came out over the weekend, darkness ablaze pre-releases. I know Sean had like, I opened up one because my buddy was kind enough to buy me one. Um, but Sean did a whole, like, you did like a whole tournament on Twitch. Yeah. We, uh, a couple friends of mine, uh, Ryan and Kyle shout out to y'all. If y'all listen, uh, they they went and grabbed a few kits. I actually grabbed several others from a different game store. Um, and we did two like little round robin tournaments. Uh, it was just the three of us, so the tournament was pretty small in structure. But the uh yeah, we did two tournaments in all. We did them kind of best of three ish mostly. The second tournament we kind of got bored and just you know switched it to best of one <laughs> again because we were like, we kind of know how this pre-release goes. And I think switching it to best of one for the second tournament is a pretty good indicator of my opinion of like how these events actually would have gone down if you went. Um, I will save my opinion uh, of pre-releases until after your oh, rant. Strong opinion as well. I can say I... It's not really strong. It's not really strong. It's... Uh, anyways, go on. I genuinely really like pre-releases. I, you know, I, my first pre-release is Unified Minds, so I haven't been doing them that long. But I love them because, like, you know, you get a bunch of people that also come in for a pre-release that don't normally come and play the game. So it's a really great opportunity to meet new people who are maybe casually into the scene or more so a collector, but they do know how to play a little bit. I really like that aspect of it. And then on top of that, you know, you get to see all these cards. You get to, you know, get, get your hands on the card first. It's a lot of fun. And so living in a city like New York, where there's like a bunch of different, um, you know, card stores around... You can kind of like plan a whole weekend or two weekends basically around pre-releases where it's like, okay, on Saturday, I'm going to go to this one and this one. Sunday, I'm going to these two. And the next weekend, I'm going to do the same. So you end up going to like seven or eight pre-release events over the course of two weeks. So it's like a whole, for me at least, it's like a whole event. Now, what I love about them is previously, you know, you would get like your evolution kits in the decks, but then, you know, you could actually build something a little bit more unique or different uh, based on the pulls. So like Unified Minds, you know, I was still learning how to play pre-releases, like how to build decks. But Cosmic Eclipse, and then in particular Sword and Shield, you know, if you know how to play a pre-release, like building a deck for a pre-release is a lot of fun. It's like the only format that's truly draft that is done by Pokemon. It's not a cube, right? Like it's a real format that Pokemon does. It's a draft format in many ways. Um, like sealed, sealed is what I mean. And so like, that's fun. And like, I started getting into other games because I was longing for like a bit of a sealed format kind of, you know, thing. And like in sword and shield, I went 20 and three across all my pre-releases in one, like six events. And when you do that, you basically win a whole booster box worth of packs on top of what you get. 
So it's, you know, in some ways it can be worth it. But this one, I don't know. I just sort of felt like after two tournaments, I was like, I didn't feel like I could do anything to the decks that I built. And everyone else that I played, Ryan and Kyle, I don't think that they could do anything to the decks they built based on what they pulled. It's just like, it's almost like the, the, maybe we just got unlucky, but it just felt like the kit that you got was basically all that you could play with. And there wasn't that much variation because the evolution lines were very shared between them. So like several people got Hydreigon uh, and a different Pokemon. So it was a lot of Hydreigon out there and a lot of Dracozolt. And like, to be frank, these attackers that need so much energy to attack just kind of feel like you spend half of the game just powering something up in the back. And like, that's not fun. I don't know. That was my opinion. I got kind of bored. And I can tell you right now, Vanillux, the Vanillux line is, if you're going to play in an event, I think the Vanillux line is the way to go. If you pull that, like pre-release event. Are winning. Yeah. Because like, it's all paralysis. And there is no switching card in this entire set except Bird Keeper, which you might only get one of. Like, if you get super lucky, like Jake did, you get two Bird Keepers. And I'm like, okay, Heck cool. yeah. Two ways to switch. When can I find them? Who knows? Now I'm paralyzed. And so that felt like you put a paralysis Pokemon in there, Pokemon, and you don't also include switches. Like that just felt wrong. That feels wrong. And then you print Glimwood Tangle so you can make sure that I get paralyzed. Like, ugh, gross. Anyways, what were you going to say, Jake? Um, I'll just kind of go over mine. So I find it interesting as well that there was like no because you get trainers of like other sets so like we got i got a hop in mine i got a research i got a dan a pokey kid a quick ball um and i think that was all like the old trainers but i i find it really interesting how there was no switch cards i can't remember to be honest of like previous build and battle kits um because i've done i've done them since unified minds as well um when i went to naic in 2019 I actually did a lot of side events of building battles. So I did like, I did like a building battle kit with Ultra Prism. I did it with Lost Thunder. I did it with Forbidden Light. Now that's a little bit different because, you know, you get to pick your set and you can have like, you could face off, you could pick Lost Thunder and you could face off against someone with Forbidden Light. It's not all the same set. Um, but I still, I, I still think it's interesting how there was like no, switch which a switch is always in the format right in terms of standard so like i don't i think it's silly not to include it when it's such a staple but um here's my opinion on pre-releases nobody does it for the tournament really people just do it for the packs people do it for the polls like yeah the the build and battle kit gets you the promo and it gets you the evolution line which was really cool to get the Decidueye promo, the only one that I really, 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 really wanted because I love Decidueye with all my heart and getting the Hydreigon line was awesome because I feel like that's a pretty decent card. But like, you know, I could care less whether I go 3 in a pre-release tournament or I go 3 you know? Okay, maybe 3 you know, at my place, you get one extra pack. But regardless, yeah, at the end, like you're going to get... Pack? Well, yeah, like you get three. I mean, this also like differs on place. So maybe mine is more structured to just like selling the product rather than mm -hmm. really making it a big event. Um, so I, it really like that. That aspect depends on like what you're doing in your event and how it's run. But like no matter what, if you do all three matches, which could also mean a do the first two matches and then ID the third round. <laughs> immediately <laughs> i don't think you they, man who would idea a pre-release me they don't have top eight so then i can just get i know they don't have top eight so you just id because no matter what if you technically because iding is technically doing a round yeah um so if you do all three you get your three extra packs that's the only way you get the three packs it's oh, the only it's way you get the extra tournament. packs yeah yeah and then if you go three oh you get a fourth pack. So let's say let's say you're me and you're O2, right? I'm not going to get a fourth pack, so I'm just going to ID that last round so that I can go home 
Yeah. You know, like I I don't know anybody at least in my area that actually like cares about doing the pre-release. Like the, the people like maybe it's just my maybe it's just my LGS, but we only care about doing the pre-release and getting excited for it really to like hang out with other people and like get polls and get the cards early. That's that like that's really it. Like who cares about the tournament? Oh, you know, I mean, like I- in terms of the tournament, it's not like that competitive, but I don't know for me, like I care cause it's like a different format almost to Pokemon. Yeah. And so like, it's just like, refreshing. I don't know. It's really, it's, I, I just don't care about pre-releases in terms of an event, but I care about them in terms of a product. I think they're real cool. I just like, I just don't have the money to splurge on them. So God bless my <laughs> friend who was gracious enough to buy me one shout out to you, Kyle, if you listen. Well, uh, so, I mean, that's basically all I have to say about the Darkness of Blaze kits. Uh, I got some busted pulls in some of mine. Some, mine were, like, weird, though. Like, I either got absolutely nothing. I got a pre-release kit that had zero hits, which I thought was pretty weird. All green codes. I was like, that's seems like not how they normally do that, but okay. Um, I mean, I've definitely gotten no hits from... Are you talking about no hits as, like, no Vs or no, no, no hollows and, no and hollows, Vs? No hollows, no nothing. I've definitely, I'm pretty sure I've had one in the past that was zeros because I generally have shit luck on (laughs) pre-releases. Yeah. Which is another reason why I stopped buying them. Yeah. And the combination of money. I think that the no hollows, like it's, it happens, right? But it's actually no hollows is pretty uncommon. Uh, You No, yeah. I think that's a very, I think that's a very like, whoa moment yeah. <laughs> but i've definitely had plenty of pre-releases like a majority i think i've only pulled like one i did a couple unified minds pre-releases back in the day because like i was making a lot of money then i i got one that had the raichu raichu alternate art that was just one pre-release and that was like it in that pre-release it's a pretty good hit in my opinion i mean alternate art that's a that's a very cool card yeah no it's it's one of my beloveds that i'm saving for when i psa someday um then like another unified minds i had the grimsley the full art grimsley which is it's not like a super valuable card but it's a full art supporter so i'm happy with that but like i've never had more than one hit so this was like arguably my best pre-release where i got two hits out of it i got a houndoom v and a salamence v not full arts just regular arts but like yo salamence is good though so yeah salamence is cool i mean they're both like cool cards so I'm I'm and I got the the pr- the promo that I want plus a two two high dragon line plus two turbo patches plus two bird keeper toeies. Uh, we got, I think that's we can move on from darkness of blaze pre release. Not really much more to talk about. Nobody's gonna really be doing tournaments. No, um, or at least if you do. I, in my opinion, you shouldn't. If you well, yeah. I mean, in terms of like, don't go to actual like L, like card shop. But if you have a kit and you want to play with your friend. Just, just pull the vanilla, the Vanillix line. That's yeah, just, <laughs> just pull the Vanillix. Easy. Doesn't get any easier than that. All right. Do you want to transition over to the the big news that happened this weekend? I think. The, so uh, the we got a word from Pokemon about an update on the standard format. By golly, Pokemon actually said something about the state of the game, and what they said was that they were banning Belelba, Bryson Man, and Miss Magius from Standard. Which is like, what? <laughs> yeah. Because they said that, and this just might be something that we don't know yet or haven't figured out, but they said that the combination of Belelba, Bryson Man, and Miss Magius performed some pretty toxic combos, some pretty broken combos, So they were like, we were just going to ban those two cards. I've heard rumors. I don't know. I don't have any like official confirmation, but I've heard rumors that they're actually just eroding the Uh, level and Bryson man. The Japanese. Do you know if that's true? Yeah. The Japanese announcement mentions the errata. The English one, for whatever reason, doesn't. I'm Uh, like wondering if the, if the announcement was just like straight translated. No, no, I think they added some context that was not in the Japanese announcement. But oh, okay, uh, yeah, just for whatever reason, they didn't mention that there was going to be an errata. But um, the Japanese announcement did mention an errata coming in October. So mm-hmm. but the problem with the English 
set is who knows when that card, that new errata version will actually get released in America, right? Because like the product release set schedule here is very different. So yes. um, they, that might be why they're kind of like, maybe they just ban it for now. See yeah, they the ban errata. it and they release like a new art, new, we'll new see. text, whatever. Or like see symbol. how the errata performs in Japan first, like before they commit to putting this card in a promo product just to make it legal again or whatever. Yeah. Um, I could see them just sort of like doing that and be like, okay, we're going to hold back on this. Uh, but I think it'll come back. That said, though, the ban is the ban is nuts. I think it's like really like out of the blue because like, are you aware of it? Because I'd like to think that I am. I, I know more Japanese decks than the average player. Was there really a broken combo that you had seen? I have not seen a deck list that has Bilob and Bryce Man and Miss Magius. I don't think that the two combined are what people are worried about. I think that they have separate problems. Um, I mean, people just cre- scream and cry about control and mills. So, like, there's Bilalba and Bryce Man for you. And well, that's Miss Mages too, right? Like, I think that the reason that they would do both of these is not because they provide the player who uses either of them a benefit to themselves. It's because they provide, they create a detriment to the other player. That's why you ban a card. Um, and I think the reason being is the same reason they banned let loose Marshadow, right? Didn't they ban let loose Marshadow? Yeah. They banned let loose Marshadow yeah. and expanded. Yeah. And expanded as soon as they rotated, they banned it. Exactly. And the reason being is because they think it's unfair for a player going second to have to start with a four card hand, which I agree with. I'm like, that seems unfair. And the reason for the Miss Mages ban, what they said was the introduction of another draw Pokemon in Crobat created a greater opportunity for unfair um, play, basically. Which I think what that means is like having a Crobat after the first turn doesn't, I don't, I don't think it matters. I think what matters is if you go first on the first turn and you're playing Miss Magus, which has Duskstone still in format. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, if you really built your deck to be a hardcore, I'm going to stamp you down to not much, then like you could end up easily getting, okay, I'm going to quick ball. I'm going to go get, uh, Miss Drevis and you maybe have a a dusk stone in hand. Let's say dusk stone check. I'm going to Dedenne, throw all this stuff away, get into another Miss Magus, another dusk stone, right? So right Mm -hmm. there you're down. You know, once you pop those two, you're down four, you know, your opponent's down to four prizes, stamp. It's literally the same effect as let loose. Now, maybe there was combos that got you all the way down to three or two prizes, and then you get stamped down to two before you even have a turn. Um, Because I think that the trade-off there is, yes, the person is taking prizes, so maybe that makes it a little more fair than Marshadow. But what they said is it makes it far more consistent with the introduction of Crobat. Because before, all you had was one Dedenne, basically. You have Dedenne yeah. and then maybe a Jirachi. But now you could have Jirachi, Dedenne, Crobat all in the same turn with scoop-up nets to rotate Jirachis even. Mm-hmm. Um, I think all of that sort of combines to f- sort of form this really unhealthy scenario in which you could end up having a player going second with half the hand size that they should have legally you know based on the way you start the game um and then the Bilalba bryson man one i haven't seen anything out of japan that has been particularly broken and i think there's a reason for that because they're banning this when rotation happens in japan it's not actually banned yet Mm -hmm. so rotation is going to happen and there's going to be one card that rotates out and that card is a rangaroo with resource management yes so if a broken combo like they're talking about were to have occurred in the current format, then players could potentially choose to play a Rangaroo resource management. And that is how you counter that strategy. But without a resource management or Rangaroo, there is no counter to something like a toxicity mill, right? Where you can surge Belelba, Belelba, Tox, and that's 11 cards in a turn. Um, And now that there is literally no hard counter in an orangaroo that can just put cards back that I think again you you're in a situation where it's like players no longer have the option to counter this 
until we print either a counter again, which I don't think they want to print a Rangaroo again. I think they realized how toxic some of those Rangaroo decks were. You're offending me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just saying. As a control though, player. I I love, that's the whole reason I got points this year. Uh, look, was because of a Rangaroo. <laughs> he is shrined in my memory. I have nothing against Never control forgotten. as a concept. I have you just something called against, it toxic. I have something. You just against, called no, no, it no, no, toxic. No. I said a Rangaroo is toxic, not control. Yeah, and that offends me. That is. I'm not... easily offended. I'm a <laughs> I'm a millennial. Re. You can play doll stall. Play Florida's doll stall. You're fine. But that's a bad deck. Well, it's a control deck. It's bad though. Why would I play a bad deck when I can play a good deck? No, Florida's doll stall was good. Florida's doll stall. Oh, yeah, it was all right. It was all yeah, right. It's, it's an all right deck. I mean, it's worse when you have boss's order, but it's, yeah. uh, you know, just play Shedinja. It's fine. Um, but like, I do think that that's probably, if I'm thinking about the game designer, the reason you haven't seen a broken combo yet is because the format hasn't gotten to that place yet. And they're actually preemptively banning it for a format that no longer has a hard counter. Yeah. I, mean, I just like tinfoil theory. This was like first reaction and it's definitely not how you should think about it. But the first time that I heard it, I was like, ah, shit, there goes my Eternatus VMAX counter. <laughs> I don't think that's like the right way of thinking about it. It's like stupid to think that they got rid of it just so then Eternatus could thrive. But like, that was literally the first thing that I thought of. Cause I like, mean, I was like, oh man, a, like using, Using the second effect of Beloba and Bryson Man, like that destroys Eternatus in like any deck, really. Cause like Eternatus uses eight, and especially if you have like a V Max or whatever. Yeah. Like you have another V Max deck, like, oh my gosh, you can go all the way. You can get them down to three, and maybe you don't have really anything on your bench. So you're not really getting rid of anything, or you're just getting rid of, of like Crobats and Dedenes. I think. But uh... it's like, it's like, damn. No, it was it was a good like soft counter to yeah. Eternatus, and because it's a single card that is technically searchable with tag call if you mm-hmm. play that, so it's certainly like you know, it's certainly. I think stinks. it's pretty reasonable. Yeah, it's a very reasonable soft counter. I think now the counter has to be either playing Crabominable or something like that. You know, like a ca- a card that is a hard counter, but but a hard counter that is difficult to get up it's not like tapu fini right which is a hard yeah blounds so you either have to play that or you play a one one line of galarian wheezing which i mean once you get the galarian wheezing into the active they have to discard down to at least five but it's not as good as Beloba, so it's like i think the space is just better for crabominable at that point i don't even think crabominable is that great I mean, it's a stage one the problem with it is is like without ditto your opponent knows exactly what's coming out you know, you put the crab to an extent, crab- yeah. yeah. You put the crab brawler down, and they're not going to be like, "Well, what's about to happen to me?" No, they know exactly what's happening. And then you play boss's order, and then you and you kill it, and you kill it. Fire. Yes, so you that's what makes fire. it a bad counter because it's not. Uh, it's not, you can't go from not having it to having it all in the same turn. Just play, just play colossal, Sandaconda. It's probably you're probably better off if you really want to counter. I think if you really want to beat Eternatus, you're fine. I don't think Eternatus is going to be that crazy. I'm just I'm throwing it out there. Okay, that's actually a hot topic. That is a hot topic. I think that's we should a, say that's this. a hot take right there. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I don't think it's a bad deck. Uh, I don't think it's as OP as everybody thinks. Oh, hold on, hold on. Would you consider it tier one? Mm, no i think okay. it is tier two after rotation okay i i just wanted to ask yeah no after you rotation. are the first person you are the first person that i know that doesn't really put a turn to in tier one i mean i you know i think after rotation the reason i'm putting it in tier two pre-rotation you have a lot of really interesting cards like pokemon that you can pair with it right you have yeah. the dark right prism you have, uh, you know, the Weavile with Evil Admonition. You have, you know, I think there's a couple of other. Ooh, uh, don't use that. Just use Hoopa. I mean, Evil, Evil Admonition is super good, though. 50 times? No, yeah, it's, it's good, but I don't know. I, I don't like evolving right now. 
Maybe I mean, post rotation evolving is better, but I don't like evolving. I mean, that's fair, but I think my point is like, look, there's a lot of good support with it right now. And mm-hmm. then I think if you were running, maybe those, maybe there'll be a version that's better post rotation. But I think a lot of the versions I'm seeing, the popular ones are all like straight Eternatus, at which point I'm just kind of like, ah, I don't know, a 4 4 line of Eternatus. It's just so easily counterable, so linear. You're hitting for 270 damage, which is like, it's, it's good in, you know, two metas ago. It's, it's good two formats ago. But, you know, if other people are playing VMAXs, which I think Eternatus starts to force, like it's good enough that it forces people to play either one prizers or, or other VMAXs, right? Mm-hmm. Playing something in between other than Vigavolt, which can item lock you. Playing something in between is now like, okay, well, you're just asking to be one shot every turn. Um, so I do think that is a mechanic that, that helps force people's hands one direction or another. Um, but outside of that, I, I just, 270 is not great. It's easier to get up than Charizard, but it's not as powerful as Charizard VMAX. And so I kind of feel like it sits in this awkward ground of like, if your opponent hits into you first you'll be in the same spot you're in with things like Dragapult, um, which is, can I afford to not take a knockout and then give up three prizes? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I don't know. Anyways. I'm just glad we got a super hot take. <laughs> okay, good. And I hope everybody on Twitter talks to us about it. Remember, yes. when you, when, remember when you yell at us on Twitter to at, when at you me. at the podcast mention sean specifically Mm -hmm. don't specifically mention jake because jake just wanted to have sean voice the opinion jake (laughs) is now talking in the third person jake uh jake feels like eternatus is tier one i I mean look i think pog it will be tier one i think after rotation we'll see but i want to be proven right i I don't think it's as bad as reshiram and zekrom which is oh which that was a deck that was overhyped and underperformed Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. I think it's better and expanded than standard. Yeah. And look, I, don't get me wrong. I'm going to be buying a play set of Eternatus at some point when the, when the boxes come out that have the promos. Yeah, I'm down. But, uh, until then, eh, I'm not in any rush. There's other decks I'm excited about, but we can, we can talk about those decks on, I think the podcast leading up to the pog format. Yes. We that will whole, be, that, that's that my will plan, definitely be a whole topic. podcast that talks about that meta. Anyways, you know what we can't talk about, though? That is also somewhat of a radical idea. Actually, wait, no. (laughs) This first part is not a radical idea. The second part of this topic is a radical idea. The first part is talking about, like, kind of the area of Stefan Ivanov's article. If you did not see it on Pokey Beach, it is a free article. I highly recommend going to read it. It's very, very good. Posted five days ago, six when this episode comes out. What is a good format? That was the entire, that was the topic of this conversation. And it, it, especially if you're like us and you started playing very, very recently, um, Stefan really goes into in this article, like the history of the Pokemon TCG going from black and white to where we are now. And then also talking about like, um, has a brief little section about like game design, you know, cause he's, he's looked at other TCGs. He's played in other TCGs a lot. So he has like a really good grasp about like card games. I feel like in terms of these different things, like there's a reason that Pokemon, um, asked him to be a part of that one player's cup, like meta analysis thing. You know, he's a, he's a two-time NAIC champion last two NAICs. I think he kind of knows what he's talking about. Yeah, Anyways, he's got a good grip on, uh, on this whole thing called Pokemon. Yeah. And so he, do you want to go into Sean a little bit? Cause I gave like the introduction, like kind of the deeper, I mean, going into of it. Basically Stefan, his article is all about like what makes a good format. Mm-hmm. And he talks, you know, briefly about, game design mechanics, like why certain cards or whatever might be printed, themes, all that kind of stuff. Um, And tries to sort of 
understand or, or dive maybe into what the game designers were thinking through different eras of Pokemon. Like, you know, clearly they printed these types of things and these types of things. So this must have been a bit of their priority. And that I think is a wonderful, you know, like you were saying, baseline to sort of maybe understand how the game has evolved over time from just purely like what types of cards existed and what they could do. Um, and it gives you a better sense of like how this current format fits into that history. But yeah, so like the, I mean, he specifically to give the an idea. So like he specifically references when next destinies came out, how like Mewtwo EX was the big thing. Like it introduced EX Pokemon, ton of HP, really good attacks, gave up an extra prize. And then Mewtwo EX, for those of you that don't know, X-Ball Mewtwo does 20 damage for the amount of energy attached to both Pokemon, yours, your active and their active, um, for double colorless. Like, that card was just, like, designed to be good, like, right? It's, like, ADP. That card was just designed to be good. And it definitely, like, especially during that time when Next Destinies was out and when this card was standard legal, like, it dominated the game. Like you look at a whole bunch of different tournaments during that time, whether that's like NAICs or regionals, it's very often to have a Mewtwo EX in your deck. If your deck is not focused around Mewtwo EX, you probably have like one or two in there, right? To take down an opposing Mewtwo EX or other things. Anyways, continue, Sean. Sorry. No, no I mean, that's like, you know, I didn't have much more to say but other than like, yeah, he just sort of talks about, you know, past cards, past formats in general and then he starts to tries to analyze okay well what what makes formats that people look back on fondly things that people look back on fondly like right like what do they share what do they all have in common um mm-hmm. and then you know i think it's important he, he also compares that to the current format as well although that's not really his point his point is not about trying to say whether or not this format is good or bad it's simply giving this format a context with which to compare it you know, he, 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 I think he arrived at a few different um, principles for Pokemon uh, about like what makes a format typically considered good. Um, and I think the first one of those things are a variety of play styles are viable. Um, and what do you mean? Cough, cough, sword and shield format. Yeah. 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 Not, not, well, I mean, there was two play styles, but. The point that he was trying to make is like different play styles, meaning like you can go super straightforward, you know, like attacker play style, like aggro, take prizes, all that stuff. You could also play slow. There's definitely setup decks um, that are still viable in this format. Uh, Maybe not this one, but that would be viable in a format. You have mill decks, you have control decks, you have stall decks. Um, The more play styles that are options for players, um, that level of variety seems to breed a good feeling when looking back on a format. Uh, Mm -hmm. And maybe that even breeds a good feeling when you're in the format. His point though, is that, you know, people only ever think highly of a format in retrospect. So like, yeah, no, I was going to mention that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So he directly references that people like in the format currently, they're like, this sucks because they just want like something new. But then like, you know, we think about right now, you know, people are playing retro formats left and right. You know, they maybe didn't like the format at the time, but now two, three years later, they love it. They want to keep playing it. So Jake, what, what was another big takeaway for you? Like of like what made a format good? So I listened to this. I listened to the tag team podcast, which if you don't know, is hosted by JW Crewall, Flex Eddie Righteous, and Riley Munner. Excellent podcast. Highly recommend you listen in correlation with ours. They don't run on the same day. I think theirs comes out on Thursdays. Anyways, yep. they were talking about the state of the game at this point in their most recent episode last week. And I had this like I was listening to that and I had just read this article. And I had this like huge hit the blunt moment. And I was like, what if Pokemon TCG became so complex? You know, because we talk about everybody screams that this format's too linear. This format is not very skill based. 
um it's very like rng heavy almost right um yeah there's a lot of variance in the format. yeah it's not like it's not it's not a super skill base as let's say like drampa garb or uh decidui vile plume that type of deal anyways continue on i was thinking i had this thought of like what if pokemon was too complex that it was too intimidating for the average pokemon fan to pick it up and learn and become like a player a competitive player not necessarily someone that like wants to win worlds but somebody who consistently like buys packs buys different products goes to an event whether that be a cup or challenge or you know even like a local weekly league you know what if it was too complex for a new player to come in and learn that type of thing and thus brings in the introduction of tag teams and this different era that makes Pokemon less skill based because I think it's obvious that Pokemon does not want to be magic or Yu-Gi-Oh, right? Where there's like where there is so much going on and there's so many cards and there's so many yeah, I mean you different have- things you don't have in between like you don't have interactions between players directly yes. really like you know you um magic and yugioh if some player does something on their turn you can potentially respond so from a really baseline perspective pokemon doesn't even have that po- what if what if where where pokemon was like 2 or 3 years ago before tag teams what if that was getting to a point where it was becoming like yugioh or magic and so Pokemon was like, okay, we got to hit the brakes. Like we got to, we got to introduce these like really big, powerful things to like approach this power creep. And then we got to start cutting back a little bit, which I think is kind of what V maxes are doing because V maxes are like, they're two shotting a lot. And although we haven't really seen a lot of it yet, because like with the idea of like, we still technically have tag teams in the format, right? This is like, it'll be, it'll be once like, I think we'll start to see it a lot more once the actual tag teams and GXs rotate. I mean, fully. Uh, you mean after the next rotation? Not the one coming up, but the one after that? I think the one coming up takes out a lot of tag teams, nope. uh, but we still have. It doesn't take no, out any. No, no, no. What I mean by that is like playable. No, no, it doesn't take but out like, any tag teams. No, I know, like, no tag teams actually specifically oh, rotate because I mean, it's just, team up on. Oh, the new format. Like, they makes don't them dominate less the format. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're like less, it's less prevalent and stuff. But I don't think, I don't think we really see V Maxes as they are until all that era leaves. So, yeah, I had, I had this, like, this is what I was meaning earlier when I was saying radical of like, what if Pokemon was just too hard? What if Pokemon just got too complex? Right. Sean and I started in the tag team era, you know, and I started thinking, like, what if this is actually like almost the best time to get into Pokemon (laughs) and like learn the game at a base level? Right. I'm not saying that I'm going to be the next Michael Pram. I hope I'm the next Michael Pram. (laughs) I I would be honored. But like, what if, especially with the introduction of like the toolkit, the league battle decks, what if like there's all this groundwork to just have someone learn the game at a super simple level and like this is the best time to get people into it i don't know i had that question and i immediately texted sean and sean immediately said what the fuck are you talking i'm just kidding he didn't say that (laughs) but like I'm sure that crossed his mind, but I mean, I, it's just like, it makes sense almost, right? Like, I don't know. This just makes sense in my head. So it seems where, somewhat radical, but here's where I sort of come back to like why it may technically be the easiest time to start playing, right? Like any player, especially with, I'm products, saying like learning how to play. Yeah. yeah, it, Learning it, the game. Yeah. I'm saying like it may technically be the easiest time to learn. Uh, that may be just a function of it, but was there a reason that drove Pokemon to make it like that? I think that is really the, you know, the underlying question of like, did they do this intentionally or was this just them getting lazy or I can't, I don't think it's lazy. I have no, a hard time either. believing the Pokemon company is lazy. 
No, I, I don't think it's them being lazy, but like then discovering like we are unco- trying to uncover what is the intention behind it? Because to the point you were making earlier stage, you know, evolution Pokemon. That's another thing. Uh, Stefan talks about is that evolution Pokemon seem to be um, a factor when it comes to considering a meta good in retrospect. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then he goes on to say that V's and V maxes are technically evolutions. It's like, it's like they heard, Oh, people like evolutions with that play. So we're going to print big evolutions. And it's like, well, no, that's not the point. The point of evolutions is evolutions give you unique abilities and unique abilities mm-hmm. in a variety of decks adds to a lot of like creativity and variation and, and health in a meta. But what Pokemon took away from that was, Oh, people want to evolve. And so they gave us these V maxes that don't really add abilities that are that useful beyond their obvious archetypes, right? Like Eternatus, the Eternatus archetype is literally baked in stone. Like, like, you know, you, I don't, um, I can't imagine there is a way to play Eternatus that does not involve only playing darkness type Pokemon because why would you, right? <laughs> like, what, like the, the ability is just so limiting in and of itself. It's so insular. Um, Shit. That's a big word. Right. But the, it is right. It's, I don't know what that is. It's just inward looking, right? Okay, cool. It's, it's, it's an ability that is, is so inwardly focused on like, it's an ability to enable me to do a specific thing. It's not an ability that enables me to help other decks or other archetypes. It doesn't partner well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, So I think that is something that that was missed maybe when when Stefan was saying evolutions are good because they offer you these abilities. That that's a thing, right? Um, Everyone everyone can admit Porygon Z has an amazing ability. It's just amazing. Getting it to a stage two is the challenge. Mm-hmm. And so it's like in a, in a, in a meta that is so fast in, you know, in terms of everybody just playing basics and playing gigantic Pokemon, it pushes the abilities like that out because it's like, well, I would love to do that, but it's just too much work. It's too much deck space. It's too, it's too slow. Yeah. Um, so I think that is sort of, um, a challenge when it comes to these, these designers of like, they seem to have not gotten the right message from these old formats. And now they're moving into this. And like, I I don't know like if the health of the game is any necessarily better or worse yet. I think it's better than it was when sword and shield first released. Oh God. Yes. Before like ADPZ control is just that, that was just boring. It wasn't control. That was not control or whatever. Yeah. It was just straight up mill. Um, but like, there's no reason to call that control, (laughs) but like that was, that was a boring format, but, What if, like, it's just becoming easier to learn how to play, right? I would think that, I would think that easier to get into the game competitively right now than it ever has been, not only with the products, but also the cards and the format, you know, not disregarding the fact that we are in such a information sharing age, right? Like, I'm sure, I mean, we still had the internet in like 2017, um, but like disregarding that fact, that aspect, I mean, how many, I don't people know, go into Yu-Gi-Oh now. Like if you were to walk, yeah, like, to I don't, playing I Yu-Gi-Oh, don't know. My, my brain explodes watching some of those plays. Same thing with magic. I mean, magic, magic is a little bit different because magic has magic, the arena mm-hmm. and like magic actually has like a good online system. <laughs> cough, cough. To where you could like actually learn the game. Like I'm sure that I could learn Magic the Gathering. I just haven't I haven't played and I haven't downloaded the arena, although I have many people tell me to. Like um Mark. Mark Mark uh is it Dizian? Diz Dizon? Mark Diz No 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 no. Mark Mark Dizon or whatever. Dizon. Sorry, I butchered your last name (laughs) because I don't know how to pronounce it. Um he plays magic. And, you know, he he he's told me again and again, like, Jake, download Magic Arena or whatever and just play it like you'll figure it out. I and mean, Magic is just really intimidating on the outside, I feel like. Well, OK, so to the point of like we think that this format is more inviting to new people. Right? We actually Sean was wonderful enough to put up a, a poll. poll. Yay, science. Yeah, we did. We did a poll in Verbank. 
Sean um, did a poll. Now I'm going to say right now, this poll is mildly scientific at best. It is not like a hardcore definitive anything. Uh, because one, there is the bias of where the poll was conducted, which is Verbank. The only people that are going to respond to a poll in Verbank are people that are already super into the game. So you're not going to get the average like casual player who goes to a league, you know, in the, in the pre COVID times, uh, yes. you're not going to get those people responding. So it's already biased a little bit towards more competitive players, but there's really no other place to do a poll like this. It's like, it's the biggest form. It's 20,000 plus people. So that's it's why like the it best that we can do. Yes. As of right now for what the world is at and for what, like, this is like the best that we can do at this point. And so this poll, I asked people, I said, okay, when did you start playing the Pokemon TCG? Um, and I gave them a, a list of years. And the only thing was like, if you played it 20 years ago and then stopped for 10 years and then picked it up again, just start when you picked it up again, like pick that mm-hmm. year. So we just basically asked that. And what I wanted to see was, were there any years that were more uh, or less effective at bringing in new players, right? Um, that can tell us a bit about maybe the set that was released or what was going on in the world. And then sep- secondarily, what is the retention rate from different years that we're starting? Meaning if a player started you know, three years ago, are they generally more or less likely to have continued playing versus a player who started five years ago or six years ago? Now, all of this is to caveat, there is a natural rate of decay. I don't know what that rate is. We don't have enough data for that, but there's a natural rate of decay that occurs for any hobby. People pick it up, they play it for a while, they quit. So I would expect all of these numbers to go down over time, no matter what. But there are some interesting nuances here in the data, some things that the data tells us about, you know, when people are brought into the game, And maybe a bit of what the conditions are like that keep people around or maybe drive people away from the game. See, like, here's the thing. This is how the podcast goes. I have a three head question and Sean makes it a five head question. (laughs) I think one thing that that you find in this data, which is obvious in retrospect, like obvious when you hear it, but I think interesting to like have it codified is that new set releases, meaning... um, like new eras of Pokemon cards that correspond with the new video games tend to bring in more new players than average. So So like we're talking about the release of Pokemon Black and White, Pokemon X and Y, Pokemon Sun and Moon, that type of thing. Yeah, so... That's what that means. Those windows of time seem to be a big moment for Pokemon to bring new players in because it's like a bit of a fresh start. You have new Pokemon, you have a bit of that game hype that you can, you know, leverage a little bit. So what we see in the data is once you get past maybe like 2010, 2011, there's so few respondents that I'm not going to talk about that. It's just, you know, people who've been playing that long, like props to you, but uh, you are a small and uh, passionate bunch. But what we do see is there is a significant spike between the year before Black and White came out and when Black and White came out. The number of respondents who started playing in that year versus the previous year doubled. Um, and then again, you see it, you see like new people come in and then like the years, a couple of years after that, the number of new players that come in overall kind of dwindles. It doesn't stay at the same rate. And then boom, like clockwork, 2000 and, uh, 2014, you have the release of the X and Y base set and you see a pop yet again in the number of players who came into the Pokemon TCG and have stayed in that era. So 2014, you see a a big jump. uh, And then you have that exact same thing happen at the beginning of the Sun and Moon base set. Actually, the Sun and Moon base set group is the largest group of player respondents that started and are still playing of the entire poll. Not this year, not last year, not the year before, but 2017. I think that also um, because like XY Evolutions came out that year, right? Um, No, no. Evolutions came out the year before. It came out in 16? Yes. Shit, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, look, you could say that, and I will say, look, in this data, it also seems to be a trend that you have a base set year where people are brought in. You have the year after that, and fewer people typically get brought in, according to this data. And then you have 
the final year of a set of like a, a group of cards and there seems to be a jump again because Pokemon releases some special thing in the XY. Yeah. Era. So like yeah. the XY era doesn't, the XY era doesn't have that because like they're so like, I don't want to just constrict well, it to the video games because XY like has much of Pokemon's. Well, no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, XY did have evolutions. I also want to mention that like, we're not just talking about, I like, we, we, we keep referencing the video games, but like Pokemon is much more than the video games. Pokemon, a vast majority of their revenue is merch. We recognize that, but I think for the average person, it's easiest to talk about the video games. Cause like the merch comes alongside the video games, right? New era of merch. There's new Pokemon, you know, in the new video game as well. So I just, I, I don't know. I feel like it'd be weird if we didn't say that. So that's, I just wanted to throw that out there real quick. Yeah. So I think the, the point you're making though is like, you know, 2016, the last year of XY, they released evolutions, which is a hugely mm-hmm. popular set. And then the last year of sun and moon, is when all the tag team Pokemon come out, which is a huge marketing tool for them, right? You have Mm -hmm. the poster child, Pikachu, alongside Zekrom as this- And then Charizard is one. Exactly. Well, that was the next set. That was the next set, but- It's, yeah, you've got these big old Pokemon with big HPs and you can stick them on all your promotional materials and yeah, it brings people in. Um, So what I wanted to look at though, like, so that's like one thing, right, is- there's clearly inflection points that Pokemon creates with new sets and then special collections. The question is when it comes to like, is the meta bringing in or, you know, retaining players is what is the retention rate uh, from one year to another? And how does that drop off after those inflection points? And look, sample sizes are small, but what I can tell you is, there were 58% fewer people who started playing the year after XY came out and are still playing today than started playing and are still playing when XY came out. Meaning XY probably brought in more people in general, but the people that came in the year after had a greater tendency to not stick around versus the 2018 crew that came in after the year after Sun and Moon released, there was only a 27% reduction in retention. Now, that may all even itself out. We don't know what the half-life of a Pokemon player is. It could be three years, and so we haven't reached that point where everybody drops out yet. But that might suggest, to Jake's point a little bit, that the introduction of things like GXs and, you know, subsequently all of these big old basics even if you didn't start playing when the big basics came out, maybe these big basics are what, you know, has made it simple enough for people to keep playing. You don't drive a few people away who may have been driven off by over complexity in previous eras, even though, you know, a lot of players look back on that fondly, it might be complicated, too complicated to people. So I don't know. What do you think, Jake? I find it really interesting. I also looked at, numbers in terms of how many people went to like different events throughout the years. So like I'm talking about like regionals, I'm talking about internets, worlds. I tried to just restrict it to American standard events because I feel like that just has the most people that has the best or I guess I should say more consistent data. So it's like I looked at the numbers in terms of like did Pokemon actually get too hard? Like, is there like a somewhat of a drop off? You know, like, is there a considerable number between masters players? That's what that's all the information that I could find through limitless. Is there a drop off in masters players that could further lead? So uh, what, what were your findings? <laughs> I'm just trying so, to like, get to the there's no meat. like there's no like huge. It's not like, oh, my gosh, there was 200 people dropped off from one year to another. But you look at Collinsville. Collinsville had a ever so slight drop. It was a drop, though. Roanoke had a drop. Madison was weird because Madison in 2017 had like 530. 2018 had 730, which is a huge jump. But then in 20... Um, 19 and jumped back down to like 580 so like i don't know what to think about madison well um it's just kind of everywhere and then internet's like almost has that same thing except 2019 was the lowest year out of the last three four years 
Yeah, I, it's so tough. I, I don't know what other factors may have gone into that, right? Like, I want more year, data with everything that we've talked about. Was one year on a weekend that had more travel capacity, meaning like exactly. more people could take off work? Was yeah. Was one weekend the only weekend within a three-month window that there was any event in that region? Um, it, could, it could simply be the internets happened uh, in Columbus one year, and that year they didn't have anything else nearby, I don't know, within a three-month window. And that, that could simply be that's just pent-up demand, right? That you just didn't have. It doesn't really say anything about the format. It lays towards the general idea of like the information that we have is not perfect by any means. We don't consider it to be perfect, you know, but it's like it brings up ideas and concepts. I feel like I there's a lot of data that I see and I constantly am reminding my the people I work with and my clients like having data isn't the same thing as having useful data. So you know, there may be something in this. Um, I think we just to, need to be able to, we need to be able to like expand on it and we need to be able yeah. to have a constant way to get more. In, like if the Pokemon company I mean, I released an email to all their people with a pop ID and said, when did you start playing? I mean, like that would be awesome. They, I would, what I would really love is just a simple number of active players, you know, website that release, too. daily active users, monthly active users with a pop ID, it's all registered, right? So Pokemon knows how many people that have pop IDs are, are active, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and you also know how many people are registering for new pop IDs. So you could easily pull out retention rates and, um, heat maps and all of that stuff. Like Pokemon could do that now, I don't know legally, like since some of those are kids and then you have data collection of minors and uh, I don't even know that oh, maybe God, why yeah. the data is never made available. Well, you could separate that because yeah, like doesn't masters isn't when you like when you have a pop ID, it says your date. So like you could just scrap all of those and just take the masters. Uh, you could. Yeah, you you probably would have to like because you've already technically like you've already like connected the data in a sense of like. You know, when you fill out the form to be a official Pokemon player and you get your pop ID, like you have to give them your birthday. Yeah, yeah, you do. But I don't know if like they have protocols on recording that data and keeping it for any amount of time. See, um, I don't know either. I don't work may, at Pokemon. Maybe why they don't do it is because they're like, eh, we don't see any value in this. And it's more of a liability than anything to like hold this data, especially with GDPR. Mm -hmm. So that, that what is that? Uh, the like European Privacy Protection Act. Okay, uh, cool. Yeah, it's just like a data thing for Europe. And so once that went into effect, Pokemon may have just been like, you know what? We are not keeping any of this data more than a year because <laughs> we'll keep it long enough to have, you know, points totals. I, I don't know. Who knows? I just like, I think it's an interesting idea. It is definitely radical. The original concept that I thought of, of like, what if Pokemon just got too hard? I, I, think I think it's think somewhat it's radical, right? Because I think it, like if you think about their like product market fit, right? People that want super intense card games are never going to go to Pokemon because you don't yeah. have between turn actions. You don't have, you know, like on, opponent turn actions. You don't have, um, you don't have a lot of these different combinations that make for a incredibly complicated or complex card game. So instead of leaning closer to something that you'll never be, lean back on being a card game that is easier to play, easier to start. Like that to me is like the product market fit that, that Pokemon would want to improve on. I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> my brain hurts. All right. Do you want my go? brain? I don't have a headache, but like my brain hurts oh, from well. this because it's such like a crazy topic and it's a weird idea. And I just want darkness ablaze. I know me. Too. <laughs> I just want, I want, I want new cards. I want um, new stuff. Well, tell the folks about the Q&A. Let's remind them. I know we've gotten some, some responses. So last week, after last week's release of the episode, we released a uh, document that we mentioned last week as well of you can submit questions to us because our next episode after this, so next Tuesday, August the... What day is that? August the... Uh, 10th is when we record? 11th. 
Well, yeah, we'll record on the 10th, but it comes out on the 11th. Our our August 11th episode is going to be our 10th official podcast. Woo! Yeah! With that, we want to do, we want to make that special, especially during this time where, like, the format's not really changing. You know, I'm so ready for Darkness of Blaze. This would be a perfect time to do a QA and a of, like, what questions that you have, whether that regards to what do you think the best deck is next format? What is the most impactful thing post-rotation? Jake, what's your favorite color? You know, any of those any questions. questions that you, yeah, like, any question that you want to ask us that is appropriate in terms of, like, I was going to give an example, but I'd rather not. Just like things that you would you could ask your grandmother. You yeah. know, anything that doesn't relate to Pokemon. But what like our thoughts on Werther's originals. Anything you would ask your grandmother. OK, um, but yes, the the forms in different ways to ask that because we have a couple different ways. We have like an anonymous way. If you want to remain anonymous, we have a way specifically through Anchor. I think you said last week. Yeah, if you use Anchor, you can submit like a voice memo question thing i mean it's a little bit niche but you know if you want if you want to have your yeah, voice on the I mean, podcast that's the best way to do it yeah that would be super cool to have someone's voice on the podcast but um all those ways will be in the description in the show notes um for the podcast that you could easily get to and fill out we've already gotten some questions already we also have gotten questions like multiple questions from one person that is totally okay too if you have like 10 burning questions that you want to ask us feel free to ask feel free to submit 10 questions in my opinion because like for me personally i don't know about you sean but i would rather have more questions than none because i mentioned somebody commented this on my in my twitch chat uh last week but like i mentioned last week that if we don't get any questions it's just going to be me like pretending to be like the the western like ghost town noise of the wind (laughs) yeah i don't uh i don't think that's a great podcast not yeah, so, so questions, please. So, yeah, I would rather have more questions and we can't get to all of them than none at all. Or like not enough to where we because I would still like to have this at least be like a 45 minute podcast. Right. Because I kind of want to jump into some of the topics, you know, especially if if he says that Eternatus is not tier one and I say Eternatus is tier one. And so I want to talk about that a little bit between the two of us. Right. So I do want to have discussion. It's not just going to be like, Jake, what's your favorite color? Blue. Okay, next question. Uh, I want to have like actual discussion with some of the questions. Um, but yeah, that's going to be the next episode. Make sure to fill that out. Make sure to be excited. We're really excited. I am at least. Sean's probably like, oh God, here we go again. No, Another I'm podcast excited. with Get this hyped. idiot. Get hype. Podcast number 10. Um, so is that it yeah i think that is it we can sign off no interviews this week no interviews no yeah it's weird we we didn't have an interview yeah we actually have to fill uh, the time ourselves as opposed to just pawning our work off on somebody else yeah i know right like (laughs) god actually doing things in life anyways we'll sign off i will leave with the lasting thought pokemon when they banned biloba and bryson man they also talked about expanded and they directly said that Expanded has a problem and Expanded needs work. But because there are no Expanded events, they're not doing anything about it. That's basically too long to read. Yeah, I, such a lazy response, honestly. Yeah, I think that's bullshit. Anyways, uh, just whatever. I actually made a deck profile of an Expanded deck that's actually not degenerate and kind of fun. Uh, combo Zorark. It's Zorark and Jirachi Prism. It's a lot of fun. Oh, I like that. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Cool deck. Go check it out if you haven't already. Anyways, that's it, I think. Yeah. Signing off. Deuces. Deuces. Oh my God, there's a squirrel on my window. Holy cow, that was that freaked me out for a second because I was like, I should not see anything in my peripheral vision.